Sure. Liana. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Liana Solomon. And um, here with Melissa today, we're going to talk about um, globalization strategy playbook. So do you, have you read the book? Any show of hands? All right, excellent. So for um, Thank you. the rest of you guys, it's going to be new, but um, it's OK. We're going to cover a little bit of um, what we're talking about in the book. Please um, go to like we'll show you how to get the book. It's free for anybody to read. It's about 100 pages, so uh, it's not going to be 15 minute read. But it pretty much covers five major topics is what is a globalization strategy in a company? Usually it's an enterprise. Um, what can you um, do as a language strategy? What tools you can use, reporting, et cetera. So right now on this um, Slido um, survey, would you please vote on what would you like to learn today? Um, whether it's reporting, whether it's strategy, we have some something prepared, but uh, it would be good to actually address what you would like. Um, and uh, with that, Melissa. Who will you? Mm. And we will use Slido for your question and um, answers too. So please um, start answering, asking questions too. Okay, localization of uh, software and applications is the. Yes, this is exactly uh, what we would like to talk about. Excellent. 56% uh, of software and app. Then we have 20% uh, of website and service. We have students here and vendors. Another poll um, is what would you like to learn? Starting in dashboards is winning. How to be strategic in a company. The next one down is how to work with stakeholders, how to create a roadmap, and how to create a go to market plan. We anticipated yes. you all absolutely for this presentation. Excellent. So, strategic at the company, stakeholders, and dashboards, and roadmap and go to market plan. Right. Thank you very much for your input. Let's start then. All right. So we had our slides set all prepared and we had really anticipated your answers, thankfully. <laughs> so let's let's start by talking a little bit about strategic elements um, that you have to consider as as you um, work with your stakeholders and you try to achieve um, co coherence in your planning and to make sure that that you get a seat at the table for the importance of the the products that you're developing um, so i work for a software company and um, Usually the focus of the software is anything in English. So as a globalization team, it is often very hard to bring in the language lens 
to the production because you do not know how to attach the value to the revenue of the company. So we can talk about it a little bit uh, today. So in the book, when you read the strategy um, chapter, we go about what does strategy mean in a company? One is how to create a roadmap, how to know what to deliver, how to partner with people to do that. But then the other part is how do you structure your organization? If you're leading um, globalization at a company, what kind of roles do you need in your team to actually deliver and make a difference? Is it engineering? Is it project management? Is it linguists? It will depend on your company. And because it is so specific to each company, we go over some examples, some suggestions, but we encourage you to think through, and that was um, what we're trying to do, is create a framework that you can use to think about those topics um, and make them work in your specific application. One of the things that, that you'll um, think about at the beginning of, of um, solidifying your strategy is how does your company think of their goals, whether those are short-term goals, intermediate level goals, revenue goals over a period of time. You should be thinking about those particular areas, not only just what you have to offer as your products. How does it fit into the, the overall initiatives that are going to be part of your company's overall strategy so that you're not just coming in as, a, as an addendum? but rather as a, as a real partner player. Um, and also, Um, and also as a um, as working with stakeholders, what you would be doing is creating relationships and understanding how do they um, work so they're successful. So you would add localization and um, like multilingual audience success to what they do. And that's um, another thing that our book is covering is how do you as a person or a team who works across the whole company can create relationships that would advance your users, the multilingual user experience, not just English speaking. So all of our authors who contributed to the book had in the strategy component of, of the globalization playbook, we all talk about those stakeholders and the partnering potential that's so critical to working. If you're in a development organization, you often don't go outside that development organization. You're, you're in, in part in, ingrained in the, the, um, the technology that you're developing and the, the types of, of information that, that you want to make sure gets included included in the product, but it may be not the correct uh, focus for your stakeholders and your partners. And um, I work for an organization where I'm lucky to be customer facing. We do a lot of customer interviews, um, like over a hundred, we did about 200 last year. So we actually hear directly from the customers what they are doing, what the experiences are when they're deploying our systems across the world. And most of our customers are global enterprises. So often in uh, various other organizations, you do not get this opportunity to understand what the customers are doing. So then you need to find people who do. It's customer success teams or marketing teams or engineering teams, product teams that you would need to partner with to understand what exactly your users are doing when they do not speak English. What are their journeys and how can you help your sales teams sell in those regions uh, to the audiences that are non-English speaking? Often your your strategic field partners, whether they're in sales or a support uh, or a partnership um, group within an enterprise or a company, they're really valuable partners to have in in the way that you are going to promote the product, the, the localized product and the internationalized components. So it's very critical to, to be thinking about the, think across, think across a range. And 
Um, I just want to bring up one point that's on the slide that you'll see under localization strategy alignment. And uh, right before we started this meeting, Tex and I were having a short conversation about consulting. And one of the things he mentioned was just the point on this slide, looking as, think of yourself as a consultant for your product or your, uh, your localization offering, and you're going to be doing a gap analysis and finding what the, the um, gaps are between what your customer in the field needs for a localized product and what your production team or your development team already may have or may not have. So that gap analysis is, is a critical overall component that you you're going to want to include in your strategy and and one of the things that you probably um, already discovered in your experience is that nobody wants to talk about localization or internationalization it, they just you know brush you aside and to some extent it's really not their job. People focus on certain things in their jobs and not globalization. So as ambassadors, it's often our, um, I guess, job to make them care because you help them um, be successful. And that also reflects in your reports. So you as a localization group or globalization team do not usually influence the revenue by yourself. If you, when you think about it without English, we would not exist. So often the customers like look at the software and never say, oh, I'm not going to buy it because it's not translated in French. Sometimes they do, but very rarely. So sales deals are never impacted by lack of translation, et cetera. But it definitely adds value if you're selling, say, in France, and your software is translated, you know you will sell more. So teams like sales teams or support teams will help you gather that data that directly de um, co correlates to the revenue of the company. Because when you report, all the business data has to contain some kind of dollar amount or whatever amount that will measure your success as a team. And this may be an area where it's, you're not in your comfort zone to be looking at this type of data and reporting. Um, you may be looking at error rates or, or bug report, bug reduction, typical software types of, of um, data points. What your partners are looking at is something quite different in many cases. They are looking at customer impact and the ability to sell into a market and to sell a product um, and maybe a suite of products. So your job becomes even more complex because you may have to combine data points from other products that you're working with or if you you're part of a product suite and you're not selling something independently if you see that your um, company is in a market where they may not have the the type of um, business infrastructure to support your products this is something that you may not know in in your development organization but it's really becomes critical to the overall success of your products that that are localized and so we also in um, our book we're focusing on the business side of uh, globalization usually historically most of the teams are focusing on delivery of translations when you report you will say we translated 15 million words and this is how much we spend on these languages etc and it's really not a business metric it is usually you know sometimes you say oh this vendor saved us you know this much money and nobody usually cares but what you can do with when working with other teams is define what is the business problem that you're solving and the emphasis on business. 
So it is not like operational. It is very little to do with what is the right way to do. Clearly, we all want to speak to our audiences in their native languages, but unless you have unlimited budget, you cannot. So how do you define the business problem and then solve it with providing the content that the audience needs to create sales, sell applications, software, onboard them, expand their usage of your software? That's the topics that your business partners will be looking um, to hear from you to understand how your contribution actually it's expands the company presence in the country, how you can make your customers successful with adding additional languages. So this might be a good time to, to take a pause and get you to talk a little bit. Um, do you have any particular comments, um, st case studies that you'd like to share with us around these two topics that we've just outlined to you that are, again, they're, they're detailed in the globalization playbook in the strategy section and also in the reporting section. And it's a compilation of best practices from many different enterprise companies. So you're getting a lot of, of wisdom from, from a, a number of, of uh, really valuable sources. And I have Slido too, so. If you do not want to speak, I can read. Thanks. Um, so when you're you're trying to advise different companies, right, like uh, you know, people who are involved with localization management, product management, that sort of thing, who are the the sort of allies within the organization that they can lean on to find, like, let's say that, you know, the localization managers like I know we should be doing Brazilian Portuguese right like do they go to the field marketing team do they go to marketing analytics do they go to you know directly to sales who, who are the different sort of allies that they can find the organization to sort of build business case for going deeper into localization all, all. short all. answer all, all. But uh, the question that your finance people will ask you, whoever will give you money for the Brazilian Portuguese, will say, what is the business problem you're solving? Again, how can I take give you $10 and get 100 back? So that's the case that you would need to make. And you know, within your company, go to your strategy team or go to your finance team. It's definitely not engineering because they're mostly usually um, execution part after the strategy is done, but they often do finance things like additional languages because the engineering team is um, enabling them in the software that you provide. There's also product teams because they are in the market of defining what the product will look like, the roadmap and then um, actually finding ways to finance things like that. But mostly your allies are salespeople. And S salespeople, you have to be cautious yeah. with, with sales because remember sales in many cases is about the deal. It, it's about a specific amount of revenue that they're going to bring in and they may move on, may not, but um, in some cases it's a one-off. So what they're asking for is a special rather than, than, than something that's sustainable over a, a long period of time. And they also will ask you, uh, well, they will tell you the TAM, total addressable market, which is n not something you can go with, with to the bank. So what you need to do is the commitment. How many deals are depending on Brazilian Portuguese? So if we have it out of the box, how much money do you promise to add to the revenue? Exactly, that's the hilarious part because they don't want to tell you, but you can. If they really want it, you have to hold them responsible so they're partnering with you. And that's why partnership is so important. Um, and then they probably could find money through the sales operations, et cetera. So it's like it takes a village, but you, you have to try. Great question, thank you. 
Yeah, I, I thought that was a good comment about sales. You go to sales, and an important um, way to evaluate whether sales is going to help you or not is to find out if they have some commission based on international sales, because that's what drives salespeople. And um, in situations where the salespeople in name were supporting international, but in reality didn't get commission based on that, we made no progress. Well, the other thing that that's, that works with sales too, it, depending on um, the kinds of sales organizations you have, you may have a governmental sales um, group, and that is obviously going to bring you um, really good information on the language support that that's going to be required um, for for the uh, that sustaining market because those government contracts are usually long term sustainable. The the other thing uh, that that can help is uh, proof of concept. So sometimes the salespeople don't understand how important language is. And if you give them a demo version where maybe the first couple of screens of a product are localized, and you say, take this in with your customers that might have some interest. And when they show the customer that the company has enough of a commitment to actually translate a few screens, and they show them Spanish or Japanese, customers are much more willing to buy in. And so the salespeople kind of learn from that, oh, having the demo make sense, offering those product versions make the sales easier or make it a larger sale, then, then you can start to win allies. Sometimes you have to cultivate allies. It's not just a question of saying, we're both trying to do the same thing because people are thinking, yes, but we're really not, right? So make the case that way. Just one more thing um, Melissa mentioned um, is regulated markets. This is a big field. Um, and if your company does business with um, regulated markets, then often language is a requirement. So if you're going to a specific country, you can also enlist your legal team to help you and say, we cannot sell there without this language. And often, um, if you cannot sell it, you can still sell it through partners in a certain way. So you can take the money that you're spending with them and say, we can make our own $300 billion um, if we take it inside. And this is what we'll take in order to sell there, et cetera. So again, that's the strategic thinking that you would need to apply um, to your specific situation in a company. Yeah, um, so like I think people have already talked a bit about the case of when tr when the language support will bring in new customers, but there's also the more nuanced case of when the language support will be better for a customer. And in that case, you're not really pitching to just your sales team, you're pitching to their sales team. You're trying to tell them that you folks are an open product, that uh, you want more people, this will be a way to get more people. And that's a kind of cross-company Thing that you have to do. You have to convince your salespeople that this is good for them because this will help them get sales. And that's like much harder. Do you have any thoughts on how to do that effectively? And another issue around that, that strategy that, that you'll often see is that you may have a company who, who is doing middleware products or, or um, infrastructure level products that you're building on someone else's platform right. and you're going to want to map to their platforms as well so it's these are all really critical ways for you to think in a more horizontal way across your organizations to to really um, make a difference when you have those conversations with your um, partners in your company or or even outside and if I were a salesperson, I would ask you to define better. What does better mean? Better for whom? So as a company, um, all that companies care about is adoption rate. We're in sales business, right? So is it going to drive adoption? Are we going to sell in that market and you know use those features? So all of those questions you will have to answer with a business case. <clears throat> a 
First of all, thank you so much for the wonderful insights you provided in the playbook. Thank you so much. I read it. <laughs> um, I, I wanted to uh, share a thought that traditionally we think of languages per country. And recently we're starting to think about languages within countries. So, for example, um, it, how can you not have localized into Spanish in the US? How can you not have localized in, um, I don't know, Norwegian and Swedish both in Finland? <laughs> you know, all these, you know, interrelated countries where they speak multiple languages. And I feel that um, it's a much better case to make when you can st have measurements based on either browsers, based on app, the languages of the app, of the mobile, and so on. And then you can start really deep, diving very, very deep into where the money is coming from for which language. Right. Um, any thoughts on that and uh, care to expand further? <laughs> I, I just echo what, what, what you said, Jeanette. It's, it's really um, a very valuable metric to, to be looking at. As, as you keep consistent metrics um, across your, your um, offerings. Um, and it is really obvious to localization experts that language and country is not the same thing. Unfortunately, we're the only ones who understand that distinction. So often people forget that there's Spanish Chinese, Vietnamese in the US. So primarily they try to tie it to the country. And that's our job to prove with metrics that this is the span of the countries for one language. Another thing that it's important while you're looking at those metrics, again, those business questions will come up. Yes, you increased your Spanish traffic by 300%, so what? Like, yeah, we have more traffic on the website, but like, how does it help us make money? So that's again, business case. And then the final question that I always think is that if we want to be inclusive and actually talk to our customers and our customers talk to their customers in the language, why do the, does it matter that Spanish is like the biggest uh, traffic to our site. Why can't we provide the same language, like the, the native language to three visitors who came in so we can talk to them? So, and it comes down to technology. So how can you make it simpler to operate your software, your website, et cetera, um, when you can convert in any language? So what is your solution for language agnostic software website application because we're in communication business. We want to communicate to people so they understand us and so are our customers. So I think it's a problem we all will have to solve eventually. Thank you so much. It's wonderful to be here in person and I can't wait to read the uh, playbook. Um, I feel like, you know, I have been in the localization for quite some time um, before, you know, my tenure was with PlayStation. I feel that um, when the language expansion come, I am globalization team is the kind of the, the last to know about it. OK, like um, before I left, we had this Ukrainian because of the regulation we, you know, we had to launch. And then even before that, too, all the languages, it was kind of decided without our input because we are supposed to be consulted. We are supposed to be the expert about languages. So how can you, you know, give some pointers to, you know, um, get a seat in the table for the decision making, you know. Thank you. So maybe I can start off on this because I actually teach a class in language strategy at Localization Institute. And there are there are so many different avenues to to get a seat at the table and to understand when you have a valued seat at the table as well. You may be there, but no one's listening. So understanding when you have the authority 
and how you make those connections with those who are going to to use your expertise because in most cases where there are uh, globalization groups within a company those groups are the hub of a lot of information about what is happening in global use with customers and deployment of products and the problems and bugs that that are being turned over um, with the various products. A lot of that information resides with you, but to have that voice to to really sit at the table is a whole different um, level of of participation. And it's learning how to to talk to the next level of executives. It's partnering with other organizations in your company to to be effective and <laughs> running on but it, i just want to uh, kind of um, agree with you on the relationships because my question would be why didn't they consider you why didn't they ask you and often is because they didn't probably know that they have to maybe i mean who knows what's happening you know with people and often if you're not positioned in your organization in the right group it is much harder but when you look at like for example we have amazing data like we just have people who get it we analyze it and we provide reports so that was our way to get into other teams so they see us as a value add for you it could be something else you know maybe um you know, talk, if you were talking to customers, maybe provide information about what they do, but figure out a way to create those relationships. And then when they're doing something, say, you know, hey, by the way, this is like for international users, uh, give us um, heads up and we will consult you. But it, it's all about relationships. And in, in the second part of that, that relationships is having access to the data that that you're getting that your company is getting and that they're reporting on most companies now have deep analytics departments there there are people who are chartered to produce those reports showing different business metrics that are important worldwide and if you're out of the loop with that um, you can't be a voice of participation um, so knowing who your partner should be. And again, going back to what we talked about earlier, legal people are your are your friends. So are those people in procurement and all the different parts of the organization, customer support, um, the, the marketing channels, all of these areas are really very important to connect with because they have data they also are influencing the decisions that are being made around language that you may not even know about. <laughs> and one thing about data, one of my pet peeves, everybody who calls themselves analyst will give you Excel spreadsheet with thousands of numbers. That is not data. This is not reporting. This is data puking. So if you have people who actually understand what analysis is, who can look at data and then say, this is the impact on business that I see. These are the trends that we observe, and these are the recommendations we would like to give you, the company, the software engineering, et cetera, on the languages. They would love you. They will include you in every meeting. If there aren't any questions right now, one of the things that we wanted to ask you all um, first of all, I'm going to go back to the playbook and what's in the playbook. So we have a section on strategy, on your planning and vision. Um, we look at technology. We look at your stakeholders. We look at language strategy. And we also, as we've been talking about just now, do a lot of um, work with reporting and metrics. So these are the current segments that we've covered in the playbook, but we're looking at what's what's missing. For those of you who haven't read the playbook, maybe 
you have some good ideas for the areas that, that you'd like to see covered in more detail. And for those who have read it, where, where are some areas that you see um, as potentials for more coverage? So again, this is an open question. If you, anybody would like to answer now, please do that. Otherwise, um, do we have a way to, to have people send in um, comments to us? Great. So, so something I've done is with the data is, you know, after the localization, whatever the language we decided uh, for testing or, you know, linguistic QA, we created a tier model, um, like the number of user and the, num you know, the amount of revenue and then also the bugs, you know, from the customer. And then we created some kind of a formula and then waited, you know, and then kept de de determined the tiers. And then we uh, decide where to spend our, you know, because we have limited budget, so we will do the testing. So something like that, once you have a strategy, you know, maybe in the playbook to, um, you know, continue with the journey, you know, like in your localization, what are this, you know, you supposed to, and then also with the vendor, you know, the best practices and how to select vendors and how to make sure that you're getting, you know, what you are expected of them and things like that, some ideas. So um, those questions are more tactical. So you d released your software, something happened, the customer files a bug, you go and fix it. If you have multiple bugs that are related to the same problem, then you know it's a more widespread thing. Same with vendors. It's like it's every company selects vendors based on many things, some procurement, uh, regulations that you have, or you have deals with them in a certain way, they give you uh, discounts for volume, et cetera. So it's like it, and you do linguistic testing. And again, you would evaluate the quality based on your needs, on your topics and linguistic uh, requirements for the vendors. So we view it as a more tactical execution process for the strategy it's more like which language should you add and why if your company is going into um, I don't know Vietnam for example do you need to add Vietnamese language now or later do you need to add it to your product to your documentation to your portals to your marketing website or should you just add it to the product and maybe just one product, not all of them. All of those questions are more strategic and that's where you would start recommending. Um, another thing that I suggest is uh, have a differentiation between, between tactical and strategic conversations that you go into because as soon as you start getting into how many bugs we have and stuff, it becomes immediately tactical. But you can definitely start there and then leap into the strategic thing. We have bugs on this specific feature. This is my way to say like in the next release, this is what I need to work with my technical team so we do not have that. And that's the first I guess, step to strategic approach. Any other questions? While I'm going over there, a lot of your strategic approach seems to be about expanding the number of languages. Is there a point where you, you just accept we're doing these languages and that's good enough? Actually, that I'm glad you brought that up because I was just thinking about this particular issue um, in the, during the last discussion. I, I've talked to a number of, of companies and their language strategies, and, and many times you want to be thinking about how you need to deprecate a language. Um, your market may have changed. 
an, any number of factors can can change within your corporate direction, and you you may not always have a static set of of language support. So so you need to go beyond thinking of adding languages and always having an expanding set to potentially deprecating languages over time for any number of business and technical reasons. Um, I, one, one instance, I'm not going to name the company, but there's a, a rather large company that recently went out with a huge number of languages based on what their, their executives wanted to have for the marketplace. And after a year, they pulled back on something like 40% of the languages. Again, based on some of their own operational issues that they were that, that they were having and being able to support those languages and the fact that they weren't getting the customer base. They, they weren't giving it long enough, but, but basically there are uh, any number of factors that can go into to your language strategy and, and how you keep it active rather than, than a very static. And our, um, the, our language strategy is not based on expanding languages. As a matter of fact, we have not expanded our language coverage in a long time, and primarily because of the scope. So if we release a language, we also need to understand like the, the documentation, it's not that hard, but then um, how are we going to structure support? how many engineers with the language speaking skills that we can place on um, answering the problems. And then what would be the structure of, uh, you know, when the, um, when the ticket comes in and that language, where does it go? We have sometimes support that people call in certain countries, that's the preference. So it's the whole logistical thing. And then what is the scope altogether? We have websites, we have developer portals, we have about 40 various digital, um, I guess, um, properties of the company do we do all of that we have certifications we have training so all of this needs to be thought through to support the customer exactly for that language and maybe not all of it needs to be and honestly doing everything at one time like melissa said it's really not a good idea it's the best way is to start with the most important things and start expanding have a plan because then you have to you can adjust and say this is really not the good plan we can alter it and maybe deprecate a language or deprecate a, a certain translation and invest in different things but again it's going to be what makes you money? Where are the customers who are trying to understand what you're saying who are actually going to pay for a product? So if you kind of look at uh, globalization orgs, some of them sort of evolved more from marketing and some of them evolved more from engineering, right? So how does all of this vary sort of by that? Is there what are the problems different and are the let's say approaches you should take different if you're in one situation or the other i guess i don't look at it quite that way i look at it as the kind of business that you're in um rather than than whether it's a market internally you're marketing driven or or development driven um I do. I, I get it. Exactly what you're talking about. So um, when you have a product, it will be internationalization, right? Because this is what engineers do to enable your product to be localized. You will probably have a team that is localization team that does the translations of say the interfaces when you ship it, etc. And then you have a globalization team that figures out what are you going to do in the future. Um, the point of localizing a product is to sell it to prospects. The point of websites for marketing is to create pipeline, the prospects who want to buy it. So generate it, demand. Yeah. So in your, when you're in marketing, the goal of translating a website is to talk to that audience and say, look, we have this thing that you need. 
the point of the product is to say, we know you want it already, so here it is in that language. Thank you. Hi, great talk. Um, so I I'm a product manager working in a web-free company. Uh, it's a startup, so we don't have the luxury to have um, like um, many big teams, like data teams. Um, many people need to wear multiple hats, uh, so that's the background. Uh, so it, including data, they're so very different. Uh, most of the time that the data cannot be collecting uh, like that a centralized way. Um, so my question is, uh, in this case, uh, as a product manager, I need to very prioritize our resource. And in terms of oh, the company located in Singapore, and our communication style is quite different as well. So in this case, um, how we can uh, make, like customize the localization strategy tailored to customers' need there? Uh, we don't have a, like I mentioned, we don't have a large sales team like that. Thank you. Sure. Your audience is in Singapore? Yes. So then they speak English. <laughs> Why? Uh, <not> yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. So, but again, that's the question, right? Where is your audience? So your website is a product. Like you cannot survive as a startup when you do not collect some kind of revenue from the website. So it is a product, it's just in the form of a website. Um, so I think that you're lucky to have smaller teams because you're probably the expert and you don't have any problems that we just discussed, like people not asking you about localization strategy. But um, focusing on the revenue would be your best bet. So even if you don't have data, you have some kind of data. So answering the question, why do you need that language in Singapore when everybody speaks English, you would answer your question and then say you are based in Singapore, but say do business in uh, Japan, then you can say, 7% of Japanese people feel confident in English. You will not be able to capture this audience without our website being in Japanese. Also, you can say we can, this is the number right now, five people. I will grow it to 5,000 in three months after I release a version of our website in Japanese, that would generate $15 million for the company. So that's the talk that you can present to your management to get funding for, for your language. Nope. Great. Um, yeah, uh, you're giving very good example uh, in Japanese. Uh, we targeting global market, um, so uh, that will works for North America, for example. Um, really is. Uh, I want to confirm with you. You means the um, determine the ROI, return of interest, like which country or based on previous uh, revenue uh, on let's say in uh, USA that we're rating. The most we're getting the most revenue, and so let's focus on that. Is right. So you say global markets, like there are hundreds of com countries. You cannot target all of them. You have to prioritize. You say USA, right? USA, yeah, Europe and Asia. Okay, so USA, you know English, you have to provide, and then possibly Spanish, but ex exactly like are those your the people who are going to buy. Are you selling to consumer or are you consumer? Okay, so then figure out how many people speak Spanish in the US. 
are they your customers? If they are, if it's a product where all of them are potential customers, you can say this is the TAM, total addressable market. So how much do you predict you would gather from the TAM? What is your market penetration now? How many US Spanish speaking people are buying your product now? And then if it's a subscription business, you need to figure out the lifetime value of your customer. If they subscribe, say today, and they last for five years, the n subscription, for that, multiplied by five is your lifetime value. So if you get your customer today and they would last for five years, that's your average value per user. And it could be the same for English and Spanish. So if they do not believe you, ask them what, what makes you say that Spanish people are not staying five years. This is my data. Uh, I see. So you mean summoning the user group into like uh, summoning in them into free tiers, like which which is, you mentioned Spanish customers actually fall into one of a category, one of the tiers. Um, awesome. I mean, I wish I can run some time series data in Tableau, for example, to uh, really pre make the predictions. But your the customer lifetime value is a very good call here. Um, I, I would come back and do some analysis, quick, like SQL based on that. Uh, also, even remind me about growth funnel, for example, like in the growth strategy, um, or in startup kind of work a little bit differently. So if starting from acquisitions and all the way driven to funnel two, you want to increase the revenue. Revenue is the end goal, but however, you you... <laughs> you kind of have to work every part of it to increase the conversion rate. Therefore, <laughs> uh, uh, how to ensure the, the trunk rate, which is customer falling, the, they lose their interest. Um, I, I see what you're saying. I think Thank you're you. adding marketing, which is the, um, the funnel and then product. So the way the demand generation works, you need to see what is your conversion rate. Say it's 5%. So you need to generate that many visitors in order to get 5% of them to become customers. And then it's on your product. Once they become customers and lose interest, why are they doing this? Then you need to talk to product managers like you and say, why do they not staying with us so it should be simpler at a, at a smaller company you don't have to work through so many layers yeah. Can I have some other questions, yes okay. yeah. another question i appreciate <laughs> I, I asked a lot of the question uh, thank you so much uh, may i have another one um so this te text did you have a question no, no, yeah yeah <laughs> so um, when we talk about globalization, most of the time we focus on product internationalization, localization. And I believe that culturalization is another very big part beyond that. So when we talk about strategy, or when we think about how we can work out a, a good strategy, my, my, my question is, so do you have any best practices for our team, for globalization team, to work out a very good strategy not only for internationalization, localization, not only for the languages, but beyond that, how we can work out some add value, make it into the plan, make it into the strategy so that we can provide more business impact from culturalization point of view. And- That's a great question. <laughs> so I think my myself, when I think about those things, the, the, the struggling point for myself is, okay, in order to achieve that goal, what kind, of, what kind of skill we need to build up? Because, for example, we are international engineering team in Adobe. We are the expert. Very, we know very well about how to do product localization, internationalization, build up all those continuous localization framework and so on. But I think we are lack of the knowledge on what kind of feature we really need to develop from culturalization point of view and what kind of skill we need, what kind of team we need to collaborate together, whether it's a sales team or product team, marketing team, how to find out the sweet point, the sweet point and how to find out the gaps. So those kind of questions still, 
I think when I think about the strategy moving forward five years, 10 years, so how, how I can build up my team or how we can work with the work with the related team to build up a very good strategy beyond internationalization and localization. That's this, is, this, should be, this is part of our next steps for okay, the, the add-ons to the, the, uh, the globalization playbook. It's just the kind of, of information that we wanted to solicit here. Um, culturalization, for example, there, there are some way some ways that you could integrate it. Sometimes it works with consultants. Um, I worked at a company where we brought consultants in um, to, to really manage culturalization across organizations to make them more responsive. It's, it's pretty much the way you'd, um, you'd look at accessibility. Some, some of the, maybe you use some of the same techniques, but again, this is not something that, that um, our group of authors has, has mm -hmm. really been able to dive into yet, but we're eager to. Okay, you, you mean the, cultural, uh, the, the consulting team, especially the, the, the local consulting team, they may know more know-how. What is the gap and what kind of solution exactly. we there, should? There are specialists oh, okay. out there, consultants who will come in to, mm -hmm. to a corporation and work on specific culturalization issues that, that you may have in your business or just general education so that you can build that competency across organizations and increase your, your effectiveness. Makes sense. Thank you very much. And, and also, um, I would add that um, it, it is important to have um, the understanding of how important culturalization is in your company and what is specifically it means. For example, for Adobe, I imagine colors are, you know, big different. The way you say things, so marketing brand will be the teams that would help you understand. For software companies, if we get something wrong, people will chuckle and say, yeah, you know, of course they don't know. But for products like yours, it's quite important. Uh, hey, firstly, I want to say thank you very much for sharing your experience. We have learned so much. And also, I have a question because um, uh, I have an uh, impression that you mentioned most most of the time we work, uh, we rely on the English copies, so we translate directly without whatever our teams bring to us. But for marketing, it's such a headache, you know, for more for a lot of like uh, cases that like. Um, marketing team, they usually work within their own creative teams. They have their own copies. They work on the kind of like, um, they play with the words. So sometimes it's really hard to translate. And then I'm just wondering, do you have any examples or any suggestions, uh, you know, for us to involve our creative partners early? Because we want to be in the same room when they come up with any, you know, kind of like copies that they, Need a uh, need translations later, um, so yeah, that's my question. Thank you. I've seen this in practice in, in a marketing organization, a, a smaller marketing organization, not a huge one. And if you can get in on the dis, the um, during the acquisition phase of a of, of of a partner who's going to to do some of that creative work for you. Um, and vet them before they're hired. That's always very helpful. Style guides, having specific um, requirements, um, and making globalization very apparent to them before they even write a word or create a graphic or whatever they're being hired to do in marketing. And we are um, we have talked about it um, at length to which extent a company needs to be centralized or um, localized in terms of globalization. So your best friends are local marketing teams because if you goof up an ad that they're putting up somewhere very visible or on uh, television and your company becomes a laughing stock, that's nobody is gonna like it. So target, in my opinion, specific countries like Japan, for example, to make sure that your message is on point and that's your brand team. There, 
some of the design tools today like Figma support localization. So as the design is being created, it can automatically be sent to a localization group to um, at least review, if not actually make changes to say, here are, the, here are going to be the issues when we localize it. This is what localized version looks like. Um, but it would point uh, at some of the difficulties in implementation. And if those um, culturalized versions or localized versions are shown to development, it helps development understand where the problems may be. And one more thing is imaging. It's so important. Like you put an image of a person on a um, ad and it kind of looks like a person from that country, but it's not really, it's not going to fly. More questions? When you kick us out of here. <laughs> Yeah, so usually you know, 8 30 ish, and that leaves room for a little bit more networking and the like. Yeah, so we have about 10 minutes. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there, are no, there are no more slides, really. I mean, this is much better than us lecturing you guys. Well, Sean put a damper on everything. <laughs> I'm teasing. I just wanted to make one comment too that that um, Leanna and I discussed a little bit before this this presentation, and um, that was recently. There's there's been some some press about where do best practices come with localization, and what's becoming apparent from some research is some of the best practices come from B2B companies. And we've seen over the past few years that more com uh, purely com commercial companies or, or direct to customer have gained a lot of importance because they provide a lot of language support, blah, blah, to, to their direct customer base. But when you look at the best practices in both localization, the business of, of globalization, um, the B2B companies have really been thoughtful about developing some of those best practices. And I don't know if anyone here who works in a B2B would like to comment on that, but um, I think it's, it's a good thing to keep in mind. And I, wa I wanted to address the students who are here, a few of them. And um, I would like to encourage you to open your mind when you're looking for jobs. Linguists is not the only job that is available in companies. Having the global perspective now is very, very important in testing, engineering, strategy teams, marketing teams, like everywhere. So don't limit yourself to linguistic opportunities, look wider. I think a difference between B2B and B2C is the B2B is a narrower space because it's dealing with commercial interactions. It's much more regular, uses a set of standards for the most part. And so mostly it's about the speed of integration. Um, there's some accommodation for internationalization and localization, but it's passing data in standard units, standard currencies, and so forth, which is not the same as B2C. If you're addressing a customer and you're trying to speak not only in their language, but with the right tone and spirit um, that excites the customer and maybe a little bit more general than you find in B2B, the B2C challenge is much harder. That's but a weird. lot of a lot what of the cultural. automation um, and if improvements in efficiency have to do with B2Bs organizing the kind of data they exchange, not talking about the data they're offering customers. I would like to address that since I'm working for B2B, and you're absolutely right, but the B2C companies are using the B2B software 
to talk to their customers. And so like our focus is on our customers and their customers. So the way the software that we deliver to them actually manages their translations, helping them to talk to their customers. And uh, that is the challenge, I think, for a lot of B2B um, companies because they don't think past that. They think about how can we make our software translated or localized. For us, we're trying to make our customers successful in global markets so they can speak the language of their audiences. Would you like to say a few words about how AI fits in with your strategy since you can't go anywhere in the last couple of months without hearing ChatGPT did this and AI did that? Um, we're, are we all out of jobs next year because it's all been handled by artificial intelligence? Is this strategy going to be automated by artificial intelligence? Um, do you guys care? Are you with me? I was being a little bit facetious about the job part, but <laughs> I, I do want to know if, if there's information in here about AI or do you see that as a next That's version? A, it'll be in the next version too. We didn't spend too much time on AI for the past version. If anything, we talked a little bit about machine translation, but... Um, and tools is such a topic that gets outdated so quickly. So we primarily offered a framework of how to think about tools that you can use, but not really recommending specific tools. But um, I can comment on AI, for example. Um, many companies, like our companies too, has a virtual agent. So you go in, and the reason we have it, not because we, um, um, it's fun. It's more to deflect the issues. So instead of customers calling the call center or signing it, you know, filling out tickets, they can self-help. All the software companies d do that or specific chats and stuff. Our chat is localized in multiple languages. We have a whole team that works on AI. I mean, our software also has AI integrated in it in English and other, you know, languages, but from the language perspective, it requires completely different skills to train a machine translation or an AI agent versus translation. So, but I totally agree, somebody has to train it. It has to be an engineer. They have to check and you know, you have to, for AI, you need data. Where do you get data? <laughs> You cannot get data from customers because of the privacy issues. So where do you get data? So all of those questions will eventually be answering, but yeah, nobody's losing jobs anytime soon, in my opinion. I think AI is technology. Somebody need to do the adoption. That's the value of it. Do I need to repeat that again? <laughs> So my personal opinion is whatever AI, machine learning, or so on, those are the technology, they, they, those are the foundations, but that cannot contribute to the business directly, automatically. Somebody in the middle need to do the adoption, use those technologies to generate, sorry, to generate all those automations and self-service or so on, so that we can fully leverage the AI, the machine learning to do something magic. But without Earth, so that's I think the, the role in the future as globalization team, especially from engineering point of view, that's the area that we need to really deep dive and build up our uh, skill, side, skill set and then keep moving forward. So I, I don't think we will lose those, uh, those jobs. Nobody can do that. Nobody else can do that. Any other comments or questions? Anyone working with AI at the moment here? Sure. Have a couple. Okay. How about students? Are you getting taught anything about AI in your curriculum? No? Um, 
Yeah, mainly machine translation. Uh, we do a little bit about uh, custom training the engine, just like a taste of what we'll get in a real company. Uh, in our writing classes, we also talk about uh, ChatGPT, but how, like, uh, limitation, what limitations there are, and how you can use it to help your localization team, for example. Um, Having, yeah, just like how you do P PMT, you would kind of use AI to kind of supplement. Uh, no, because <laughs> our professor is really good at <laughs> detecting it. <laughs> Human detector. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Oh, also, so we, I think we can maybe also adopt ChatGPT into our TMS and use it as a context lookup tool. So I think there will be more and more opportunities to combine ChatGPT with our current technologies. Um, and I have a question about internationalization. Uh, I would love to learn your take on the best practices of internationalization, because I feel like um, especially for startups, before culturalization, it's already hard to get engineers involved to work together. Um, although we all agree localization shouldn't be an afterthought, but for engineers, they have a lot of tasks. They have half access. They don't have time to um, just start doing lo internationalization before localization. So I feel like how to get them involved and understand the importance of uh, internationalization so we can lay a good foundation for localization in the future. Um, just very hard to, um, yeah, make that evangelization. So I would love to learn uh, how we can work with uh, engineers and how we can get them involved to work together on localization. Thank you. Um, so it is important to have the stick, not just the carrot. So for engineers, if it's part of definition of done for your product and they cannot release anything, you have to have those requirements. At the same time, you need to enable them to um, correct everything and check their code to make sure that it's correct. So what um, your team, internationalization team needs to do is build tools for them to check their code for issues before they submit it. And then also you will have the definition of done. And then the final tip is uh, if all they do is uh, avoid having hard-coded strings, you will be so much better than anybody else. I cannot even tell you. <clears throat> I, I think that's not quite the case. There's more to it than externalization, but I, I would comment the idea that an engineer has a bunch of responsibilities and then internationalization is an add-on is a bit of a mistake. You teach your engineers to do internationalization the same way you teach them to write code that has quality in it, that has performance in it. There's a set of practices that they follow. It doesn't cost extra or it's minimally extra. So you take a string, it, you don't put it in the code, you put it somewhere else. You're dealing with dates. There's always a certain API you use that supports localizing the date. It's not, I did it the American way, I hard coded it, and now I'm gonna change. So it is an extra cost, cost, but it might be education that the engineers need to make sure that they're doing it. And then the things Liana mentioned, like having uh, code that checks, lint tools, they're called, um, that you know check when they, uh, submit code uh, to be part of the build, that it already gets scanned to make sure strings are external, dates are using the right API and so forth. Okay. Sorry, just to add on to your comment, I think I saw a LinkedIn post about how we can now leverage ChatGPT to assist in the landing process. So I guess that part of technology can also go into further um, assisting the IAT and engineers in um, completing their check. Yeah, so that was ChatGPT doing what to the code? Uh, oh, it validates the, the code, yeah. Yeah, it also can generate code now, so. 
Okay. More questions? We're about at time. Um, I was going to ask about Skynet, but I'll, I'll skip that. <laughs> so uh, please join me in thanking our speakers. It was a great talk. There's a lot Thank of stimulating you for being ideas such a great and, and great discussion there. Thank you for being such a tremendous audience and the amount of interactivity was great. Thank you. And thank you, Adobe. Yeah. Yes, you have a, um, a link for the book.